You're listening to The Mary Jones Show on the Talk of Connecticut. Well, we are devoting this hour to the topic, the subject, the issue of caring for elderly parents. As I've said, it's something an awful lot of us have had to experience and an awful lot are currently experiencing it. We spoke in the first hour with mother and daughter, Patty Helen. Patty and Helen and heard Patty, the daughter's perspective in terms of putting a plan together to care for her mom and Helen's perspective, 97 years old. And she so articulately talked about what it was like to really begin needing help. Now we're going to talk to someone who has been professionally in this field her entire career. She and I are good friends. She is the executive director with CCCI, Connecticut Community Care Incorporated, Molly Gavin. Hello, Molly. Hi, Mary. Good to hear your voice. Well, it's nice to hear yours also. And and when I think of, you were the first person that came to mind, Molly, when I thought of this show idea, which actually I did not think of. Someone suggested it to me, a listener. And I said, oh, Molly Gavin is the one. Before we get spe- to specifics, um, for folks who don't know what CCCI does, could you just let them know, Molly? Thank you, Mary. My pleasure. Um, Connecticut Community Care is a statewide nonprofit organization and basically what we do is that we help individuals of any income any level of need to understand what the options are for them to stay in the location of their choice in order to receive whatever kinds of services they may need Mm -hmm. so we work with many, many older adults throughout Connecticut, persons with disabilities, and all of their loved ones to help people figure out what is the right combination of services and supports so that people can live and thrive where they want to live, just like Helen. Yes, just like, and she gave, incidentally, I want to pass this on to you, she was singing the praises of your organization and her caseworker. Oh, she's a very special lady, that Helen. Oh, she sure (laughs) is. She sure is. Well, and it's such a, as you certainly know, as an awful lot of us can relate to personally, just emotionally, Molly, financially, logistically, it is agonizing. It can be an agonizing point time in life. Patty mentioned something that I think was so, I know was so wonderful. I'd love for you to comment on it as well. She said in her experience, what she and her family did was to sit down and come up with a plan for Helen. And my guess is, would I be right if I thought that most people probably don't do that? Absolutely, Mary. It's, you know, it's a very, very difficult and challenging um, conversation for people to have. And that's why I, I so often find myself saying to people, don't postpone or delay having that conversation. Your 85-year-old mom or dad or loved one or your sister with, with some type of a serious disability who is of a much younger age, don't wait until those individuals need the support themselves. Start those conversations early on. So if, you're, if your 85-year-old mom says to you, Mary, you won't believe it, but my good friend Betty fell yesterday out in front of the house. She, she, there was a wire out there. She didn't see it. She tripped. She fell. She broke her wrist in a couple of places, and they had to put a cast on it. And your mom goes on and explains poor Betty's situation and what is Betty going to do. That's the moment to say to your mom, Mom, what would you want to do if that happened to you? Mm. Mm. So smart. What would you think about, Mom, if that happened to you? Um, Everyday life... And you know that, Mary, you know me well enough to know I don't mean this to be disrespectful of Mm -hmm. our elders in any way or persons with disabilities, but life provides us with many teachable moments. And we so often attribute those teachable moments to experiences 
with our children. And I believe that those are experiences with everyone, with our friends, with our elders, with persons with disabilities. Uh, so you, you hear the story about an elderly gentleman who was driving his car and smashed into the front of a convenience store. Um, and you and your dad are watching that on TV together at night and your father's saying, can you believe that that really happened? And oh my goodness, what a moment to say to your dad, dad, what would you like me to do if at some point in time I was concerned about your driving? Mm. Ask the questions before the situation ever presents itself so that you have a beginning conversation, a preliminary uh, a dialogue about these very important issues before you are in a crisis situation with your family. Because certainly when we are in a crisis situation of any kind, that is not the ideal time to begin making decisions. Exactly. I mean, you know. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because of the stress, because at that point, mom is, has just fallen and fractured her wrist and now mom thinks that mary's asking these questions because maybe mary thinks mom shouldn't be in her own home anymore and that's not why mary's asking the questions mary's trying to figure out how is mom going to get three square meals a day and get a shower that's all mary's trying to think about but mom is feeling so vulnerable because of her injury and because she can't get herself dressed and because she can't feed herself because of this broken wrist situation that now mom's thinking that, that Mary's, you know, 100 miles down the road and that's not where Mary is at all. But if you've had those conversations before, you can, you can refer to them. Absolutely. Now, is it true, Molly, speaking with Molly Gavin, who heads up CCCI in Connecticut, is it true that most slash all people ideally want to stay in their home? Absolutely. I mean, yes. I would think. Study, yes, study after study after study supports the fact that the vast majority of elders and persons with disabilities absolutely want to remain in their own yeah. home. And in fact, that for the most part, Mary, families and loved ones exhaust all of their financial, their emotional, just like you were saying before, physical and personal resources to make that happen mm -hmm. so the myth of you know families the negative myth of families you know willy-nilly making decisions about having people go to some kind of a skilled nursing facility or other institutional setting that is not demonstrated in the real world situation it really isn't families are doing their level-headed best to keep their loved one at home if that's what the loved one wants to do. And for so many families, it's uncharted waters. It is un absolutely, Mary, uncharted waters. Yes, you know, Molly, absolutely. I mentioned on Facebook this morning that we were going to be delving into this. Mm -hmm. And a gentleman posted, and I wrote myself a note because I wanted to remind myself to ask you this. He said, be sure to talk about, and I'm quoting, mm -hmm. be sure to talk about when your aging parent lives out of state. Yes, it's a, it's a tremendous it's a tremendous challenge for people, yes. Mary. And I'll and I'll tell you. I mean, and I know you know this, but I I I supported and 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 helped and coached my mom and dad at home until both of them died. My dad was 103, and my mom was 93. And mm. with all of the challenges associated with that, I can tell you unequivocally that I think the hardest caregiver role is the long-distance caregiver. I never was a long-distance caregiver. I was always, uh, you know, living within a matter of miles of my parents. And But to this gentleman's point, the issue of trying to provide what you believe you need to do for your loved one when you are talking about long-distance caregiving is, 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 is crushing for people. Mm. It's very, very challenging. Long-distance caregivers care just as much as people who live locally and are not, generally speaking, trying to shy away from what they see as their role. It's just much more challenging for them to be able to help. Yeah. Now, do most states have something like your organization? Most states have their, there, there are, you know, the, what, what's challenging, Mary, is that in every state in the un, union, the, the service delivery system can be a very fractured system. And so it is very difficult for people to know where to begin. I would say that most states in the union have 
some kind of a, uh, a home care program, and, and, and many have publicly funded programs for individuals who meet specific income criteria and asset criteria. And that would be an option for people who were eligible for those services. And so in every state, it is, it is worth it for your, um, your listeners to consider calling um, or, or looking into, they can look online for, um, you know, the, the local aging and disability resource center, as an example. Um, they can look for uh, uh, info line type of 211 uh, connections, and they will find the correct information to access local services. I also always offer to have your listeners con contact us at Connecticut Community Care, and we can help put people in touch with appropriate mm. Oh, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. And, you know, two pieces of good news, that there are a lot of resources out there to help. There are. Yes, there are resources, but people generally are challenged to find them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. But there is help there, and that's just important to remember, and that no one is alone. I mean, this is something that so many people can commiserate on. Right. Exactly, Mary. And and the the role of of a geriatric care manager, and that's primarily what we do at Connecticut Community Care, is a, a geriatric care manager is a highly trained professional, often a nurse or a social service care manager, who works intimately with that individual and their family, always with the individual and the family in the driver's seat, not with the care manager in the driver's seat, and helping people to identify what their strengths are, what the strength of their family system is, and then also honestly to look at the gaps. What do we need that we're not able to do as a family? And Molly, stay, stay with us. Molly Gavin with CCCI. Let's check in with our traffic reporter, Nicole Davis. Hello, Nicole. Hello to you, Mary. Yeah, just in the past 10 or 15 minutes or so, things are getting better in some spots and much worse in others. We'll start right now on 91 northbound after the Silas Dean Highway. Two lanes are blocked out there due to this crash we've been talking about for at least half an hour. It's got stopped traffic now back jammed up before Country Club Road in Middletown, and the delay continues to grow. I would certainly consider the Parkway North Northbound if you possibly can, or Route 9 northbound if you're coming from south of town. Now, on the northern side of 91, north of 84, southbound is going to be slow from just about Bequanic Avenue to 84. We had a crash earlier by Windsor Ave, which is gone. Also expect a bit of a slowdown, too, from the Conlin to the 84, the airport road, I should say, past the 84 interchange. Uh, 84 itself, eastbound, is stop and go from Park Road to the end of the Bulkley Bridge. Westbound, a crash downtown has just cleared right by Capitol Avenue, but the damage done there, too. You've got heavy stop and go traffic now back before or exit 57 for the Charter Oak Bridge. Another traffic check coming up in just a few minutes here on the Talk of Connecticut. Back to you, Mary. Thank you so much. And we're speaking about caring for aging parents, something that an awful lot of us have or are dealing with. The Executive Director, CEO of Connecticut Community Care, statewide organization that does just that for folks in terms of helping them find their way two resources to enable them to stay in their home. Molly Gavin is with us. And Molly, in addition to talking about a plan, and incidentally, uh, kind of an unrelated thing, when you mentioned your dad was 103, mm -hmm. is that right? Yep, yep. And just talked with Helen, who is uh, 97. And the <laughs> age at which people are living, Molly, it, it's, you know, it's not that unusual, is it, to, to, be, to become 100 years old? Not anymore, Mary. It certainly is not. We're seeing more and more and more, you know, elders who are living to advanced age. And let's not forget then that when you're, when you're talking about the family caregivers, many times the children of that 100-year-old elder are 80, the grandchildren are 60, and so they are also facing their own personal challenges at the same time as they're trying to support their beloved 100-year-old. Yes. So we're seeing more and more situations where multi-generations in the same family are uh, looking for services and supports. Molly, I'm going to introduce someone who has a a um, difficult, for lack of a better word, situation. Do you need to run or can you stay with us? I can stay with you, Mary, of course. Really? Okay, course. terrific. Yep. Joining the conversation, let's say good afternoon to Marie. Hi, Marie. 
Hi, Mary. How are you? I am doing okay. It's so nice to talk with you. Yes, same here, Mary. Now, Marie, if you've ever been to, if one has ever been to our girls' night out, you may have met Marie and her wonderful husband, John. And Marie, I